black lights and booze burn when I record for watch And every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot All black, everything, everything black, culture over everything, y'all, we taking it back Welcome to Left to Black My name is Mark Anthony Neal and we are joined today by Professor Caritha Mitchell Who's a social professor in English at the Ohio State University? She's the author of *Living with Lynching: African American Lynching Plays, Performance, and Citizenship, 1890 to 1930*, which was published by the University of Illinois Press in 2011. And the brand new *From Slave Cabins to the White House: Homemade Citizenship in American Culture*, published 2020, also published by the University of Illinois Press. How are you doing today, Caritha? Great. Thank you so much for having me. You often have described this book as your baby um, on social media and other places. Uh, talk to us a little bit about the roadmap to this project. Oh, absolutely. Well, as you mentioned, Living with Lynching was my first book published in 2011. And the biggest thing I learned from writing that book is that you weren't lynched because you did something wrong. Right. You were targeted by the mob because you were successful yep. in some way. Yep. And so because I left that book really truly understanding that, I thought, what does that mean for how we read African-American literature and culture? Because what was clear is that African-Americans at the time, at the height of mob violence, understood that they were attacked for their success. So my thinking for this project was, okay, if I understand that African-Americans understand that their success makes them a target, then when I read African-American literature, I need to be reading it in terms of uh, how they are pursuing success despite all of that. And so this project really is an opportunity to make sure that people understand that that is precisely how we should be reading African-American literature and culture through the lens of success. Yeah. Um... I often remember, you know, when I was a kid talking to my mother and other folks and, and black women um, who didn't work out in the world. Um, and, and we often describe them as, as homemakers, mm -hmm. um, not housewives, but, but homemakers. And, and this book really pivots on the idea of, of homemade, obviously, but, but homemaking, right? The creation of a homemade citizenship that pivots really on what you can create in a domestic space. I'm talking a little bit about that concept of homemade and homemaking as it runs throughout the book. Absolutely. Um, what I'm interested in is the fact that homemaking can look a lot of different ways. And so even in the slavery era, you have African-American women who are creating the, the sources of nurture that um, they believe is homemaking. So whether their domestic configurations look a certain way or not, homemaking and um, uh, creating and sustaining bonds is really what they're about. And so this was an opportunity to really see that when I say from slave cabins to the White House, I'm trying to trace this trajectory, right, of how we understand that um, Black women have been house slaves and housekeepers, but not acknowledged as homemakers. And what I want us to understand is that their journey from house slave, housekeeper to homemaker has not been about becoming a homemaker. It really has been about becoming a homemaker and not having that homemaking success draw more violence because they've always been homemakers. Yeah. You know, you talked a little bit about this concept, uh, just opening a success. And uh, we understand the way success was a threat to white supremacy, obviously in the post-emancipation period. But you begin the book talking about how particularly black women were trying to work through notions of success in the antebellum period, right? In the period of slavery. And talk a little bit about what success looked like for black folks during slavery. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Because a big part of what I'm invested in is thinking about cultural criticism. Are we doing a good job if we're not looking for, you know, gradations of success, even in the slavery era? Um, if we assume that it's just about resistance and survival, we're actually overlooking the gradations of success. So for example, in Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl, it is so clear that Harriet Jacobs has 
a definition of domestic success that involves being able to marry the free man of color that she falls in love with. And after Dr. Flint says, I'm going to shoot him like I would a dog if he comes around here again. She tells him to forget about her, go to the North, leave her to her fate there. And part of what we find there is that the fact that she contains, that she sustains her sense of humanity and agency enough, first of all, to while the country is telling her she's nothing but property, she holds on to her humanity and agency enough to actually have fallen in love. <laughs> that is a victory in and of itself. And you know it's a victory because it doesn't go unanswered. It is attacked. Once that is attacked and she doesn't have that um, option. She doesn't resign herself to failure. She just says, okay, I'm now going to have to define success differently. And at this point, she starts to define domestic success, not in terms of being the, the, the wife that she wanted to be, but in terms of having a home like Aunt Martha's, her grandmother's, a home that is based on um, blood ties rather than a chosen romantic tie. And it goes on and on and on. There are lots of ways that defining and redefining success is really what we see happening throughout that slavery era. And I mean, I think, you know, to go to your point, the other issue that I kind of grapple with is what would it mean for us to think about um, the slavery era and what we know about infanticide and suicide discussions to think about the fact that that's even part of the record as part of the debate within community conversation about how to define success. Some people are going to believe that the way to have success is to keep white people from benefiting from my life and labor. That is how I'm defining success. So I want us to understand there are lots of definitions, even in the slavery era. You know, it's because you're really talking about the importance of political adaptability, right? To be able to adapt to particular historical moments and different tensions, and at least creating an own measurement, or your, an, own, an index on your own for what success looks like. Do you think that kind of thinking is still applicable as we think about pol political concerns, particularly in the context of, of social media where things are so black and white? Uh, you know, it, it's so such a dichotomy, right? Not just in terms of the larger political landscape. You ain't never breaking us. But even in the context of black communities, when we think about what woke is and what woke isn't, you know, do we have the capacity to think more nuanced about what black success looks like? Oh, that goes to the heart, right? That goes to the heart of what I hope homemade citizenship as a concept will give us, that it will give us the tools to really recognize that all of us are debating about how to deal with this undeniably racist, sexist, violent, homophobic, trans antagonistic. I mean, all of the violences that literally structure our society, we're all grappling with them. And we're all trying to create a definition that we can live with of how we're going to define success. So what I'm hoping homemade citizenship can do for our current moment is help us see that we're all struggling to make that definition and to have a little bit more respect for yeah. each of our definitions because that's what we're all doing, just trying to create space to breathe and, and, and move and live and love despite being attacked at every turn. And so what I'm hoping is that we will attack each other less as we recognize um, you know, just the way that we're all doing the same thing, just coming to different conclusions. Yeah. In your analysis of, of Nella Larson's quicksand um, and also, you know, Hurston's classic, Their Eyes Are Watching God, um, you talk about this concept, and I love this framing of, of race motherhood. Um, unpack that for the audience, you know, what race motherhood is, both, you know, in the context of those narratives that you examine, but, but also what that might look like, you know, when the idea of what the black mother is, you know, might look a little different, right? You know, where we might consider a Stacey Abrams or even a mm. Megan Thee Stallion, right? As, as another mm. version of, of this race motherhood. Oh, that's so good. Oh, 
Okay, so let me try to come at this from a couple different angles. I, I think, first of all, you know, of course, Aaron Chapman is the one who teaches us about race motherhood in the 1920s and 30s. And the idea really became important in this book because it allowed me to see a transition, honestly, from the 1890s and early 1900s when being a mother was really the way that you made your argument for political involvement. Mm -hmm. But then in the 20s and 30s, race motherhood becomes a way of saying that um, Black women should take a back seat to the male worker. So part of what Aaron Chapman helps us grapple with is the way that race motherhood ends up being less politically forceful for Black women because it's all about propping up the male worker women should, you know, be at the service of men and boys. And so the connection that you're making <laughs> to the moment that we're in right now, and Megan The Stallion is such a powerful example for me, because, you know, she was so clear when she wrote in the New York Times. What does it mean to be a woman of color? about the fact that, you know, some of us think that protecting Black women is a controversial thing, but I'm not going to give in to this idea that, um, that we are less important than Black men and boys. And that is exactly what was required and continues to be required. So what I love about the way you're framing this question for me, though, is that it allows us to really look at the fact that part of what I'm tracing with homemade citizenship is the fact that there's always debate. And part of what we find throughout these decades is that Black women are always pushing, um, pushing back whenever our community conversation isn't making room for us to breathe. Good evening, my fellow Americans, and happy Lunar New Year. So with Stacey Abrams as the inspiring example for me right now in this moment, part of what she's been so good at articulating is that I do not have to fit into a specific mold for me to be a valid and important political voice. And not only am I going to be that important voice, but I'm going to call attention to the ways in which my voice is trying to be um, dis. Uh, disrespected like she mm -hmm, calls mm -hmm. out the ways that assumptions around you know she needs a husband to be a certain kind of political figure she needs children to be a certain no, no 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 she's going to call out the way that those are false standards by which to judge the the power of what she brings to the table. So for me, those examples that you've brought up are examples of the tradition that I trace throughout this book, that homemade citizenship and is about defining and redefining and defining again um, success, our standards for success, and the way that Black women have been dynamic in those definitions and making sure that um, not only will white domination not limit them, but also when our definitions within Black communities feel too limiting, we're going to, uh, you know, check that too. We just recently had a conversation with Andre M. Perry, uh, who wrote this wonderful book, Know Your Price. Um, and there's a large chunk of the book that talks about, you know, the Black investment in home ownership and how it's a mixed bag, right? Both in terms of, you know, the value of home ownership, but Black folks don't actually get the same kind of value in home ownership as their white peers. Um, but of course, you talk about the idea of, of home ownership, right, as an element really of a human right and, and Black power, right? And, mm -hmm. and you talk through it in, in looking at the work, obviously, of Lorraine Hansberry, Raising in the Sun is the best example of this. Um, but talk about what it meant, you know, for many of the folks that you look, lo looked at in this book, the importance of having a home of your own, of home ownership and creating a sense of power, you know, in this domestic space. Oh, that's, that's, your questions are always going to the heart. <laughs> Thank you so much. I mean, I think part of what I was invested in having us grapple with there um, is that part of what we have to do is acknowledge that um, I'm focusing on um, African Americans in the United States. And part of what I wanna trace is 
if they are not part of the tradition that has said, let us go to other countries and have better opportunities abroad, let us stake our claims here in the United States, then part of what I'm admitting is that there are ways in which sometimes their definitions of success look like simple um, acceptance of the so-called American dream. Right, so but right, what right. I'm so, <laughs> but what I'm so invested in having us grapple with is Black people know throughout their experience that whenever they get something like the American dream or something like anything that white people value, they'll be attacked for that success. So could it be that they're simply after the American dream when they know they'll be attacked for it? It can't simply be that acceptance. It has to be something beyond that. And so part of what I was looking at in that chapter, especially when I lean into the way that a home looks like Black power um, with Alice Ch Childress's Wine in the Wilderness, is that part of what you see them doing is defining their home as this apartment. They are not invested in a suburban household, but right. what they're defining as success is that this is going to be an apartment in which a Black power ideology reigns, that mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. putting the Black man back in his patriarchal position. And what we find out very quickly is that as that definition of Black power in that apartment is being held up, you have Tommy as the single Black woman who's pushing back and suggesting that that definition of this Black home is actually not a definition that's making room for her. And so how do we complicate again as we continue to debate our definitions of success, how do we make mm -hmm. sure that we are incorporating everyone in the community in that definition Inclusive, of success? Right, right. Yeah, yeah. The title of the book, of course, is From Slave Cabins to the White House. Um, so the natural trajectory means that, you know, the book closes with a discussion of the, the ultimate homemaker, if you will, um, you know, the, the first black first lady, um, Michelle Obama. Um, mm -hmm. And I, you mentioned very early, you know, in, in the acknowledgements how, you know, when you were conceiving this project, you didn't necessarily think Michelle Obama belonged <laughs> as a part of it. Um, and, and, you know, and, and it's our good friend, you know, Gabrielle Foreman, who, who kind of pushed back and said, no, this, <laughs> this needs to be part of the process. Talk about your thinking around Michelle Obama in the context of, of this project. Thank you so much. Oh, that's so good. Um, yes, I have been writing about Michelle Obama because I was so fascinated with her mom in chief, uh, you know, moniker and the way that it was erasing the fact that she had been, you know, an executive director of the mm -hmm. University of Chicago Medical Center. You know, if, if you're going to promote Let's Move, isn't it interesting that you're not promoting it based <laughs> on having had that expertise, but right. rather on being a mom. So I have been writing about her in different ways, but thought of that as a separate project. And you're right, Gabrielle Foreman was the one who was like, what are you thinking? <laughs> um, and part of what made that such a powerful, like once she said it, I couldn't unthink it, right? And so <laughs> what made it so powerful was starting to see how her decisions around hair, clothes, bodily mm -hmm. presentation, her decisions about how to decorate the White House in the tradition of Jacqueline Kennedy, all of those decisions were actually very much in the tradition of Black club women of the 1890s and early 1900s. So it was really powerful to start thinking about her in that tradition. And what it ends up doing is showing me how aware she is of her every success will be countered. And so all the decisions she makes really, really exemplify that she's part of that same tradition. So part of what, you know, you're pointing to is the way that I end up saying that, you know, we need to think about mom and chief perhaps as um, just a more extreme example of the strong black woman, right? Yeah. That yeah. that in order to claim citizenship, Black women have had to do this kind of overperforming. And for those of us who aren't in the public eye, like Michelle Obama, a lot of times it comes out as a strong Black woman. In her case, it comes out as mom in chief. But of course, what I'm so floored by 
in that chapter is the fact that here she is as our first black first lady, um, clearly valuing, you know, being a wife as much as value valuing being a mother, but we don't end up with a whole slate of popular culture representations of mocha moms, do we? Right. No. When right. she comes into the public eye, we end up with the help as not only a mediocre book, but then a mediocre film that ends up getting extraordinary um, success. Um, it turns into, right. you know, housewares and everything. Now, again, part of what I admit in that chapter is that, okay, let's take seriously the way that um, Black actors got their due. You know, there's no denying that the um, Academy Award nominations and awards recognize the Black talent of those Black um, actors in the help. But the fact that American culture wanted to elevate these Black women pretending to be 1960s maids in 2009 with the book and in 2011 with the film says a lot about American culture. And for me, that's ultimately what Mom and Chief shows us is American culture. It shows the racism and sexism of American culture. Yeah. So what are we going to do with Black homemaker as vice president? Um, as vice president, as blended family mom, um, mm. you know, which which is, you know, is a little bit off the beaten path for what we expect when we talk about motherhood. Um, mm. You know, how are you processing, uh, you know, vice president Kamala Harris at this moment? Oh, goodness. I mean, first of all, let us acknowledge that she is my soror. <laughs> so, so yes, I have been thinking quite a lot <laughs> about our Madam Vice President. Um, but, but you're right, this is actually something I'm still thinking through because I think that part of what um, American culture does is it shows an extraordinary capability for consistency. So I think part of what um, is important about watching how this plays out is in the same way that the Obama family became the first family and was everything that the nation said it would respect. This heteronormative nuclear family, these well-behaved children. I mean, everything you say you respect. <laughs> Ivy League, educated, right? Checked all the boxes, right? <laughs> all the boxes. Even with that, you had um, responses to them that were aggressive. So I say that know your place aggression is when your success brings aggression as often as praise. So when it comes to my soror, Kamala Harris, I think that it's not going to be the case that we don't ever see praise and recognition. It's just that there will be aggression along with it. And the fact that, um, you know, she has... Um, South Asian American uh, background as well. We have already seen how that has been another way to um, stereotype and otherwise disrespect her. So I think that that is what we're in for is that there will be aggression as often as praise. And I think that in following the tradition of homemade citizenship and the women that I study in this book will just want to be attentive to celebrating, but also recognizing the unjust um, forces that she's facing, even as she continues to deliver plenty for us to celebrate. Yeah. We've been joined today by Professor Caritha Mitchell. The book is From Slave Cabins to the White House, Homemade Citizenship in African-American Culture, published in 2020 by the University of Illinois Press. Professor Mitchell is a social professor of English at the University of Ohio State University. She's also the author of Living with Lynching, African-American Lynching Plays, Performance and Citizenship, 1890 to 1930, published in 2011, also by the University of Illinois Press. It is always great to talk with you, Caritha. So good to see you. Thank you. You're welcome. Black lights and booze burn when I record for watch and every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot. All black, everything, everything black, culture over everything, y'all, we taking it back, black.